Here I am, climbing up, feeling great, getting love. Here I go, risk it all, be worth it now, and that's for sure. Watch me as I rock it All right, here we are, Fight Talk Down Under, episode eight. Um, my name, of course, is Dan Meehan. I'm from Fight News Australia, and my co-host is featherweight superstar, Lockjaw Justin Van Heerd. And how are you, mate? Yeah, doing pretty good, considering um, a day filled with some uh, technological hiccups across the board. And like you and I were just talking about before, we're both having some some technical difficulties with some technology. So hopefully it stays good and we can smash out our episode. Yeah, definitely. It's been a yeah, it's been a, a bumpy road to get to this episode. We, um, you yeah, know, again suffered from some, from some feral children last night. So, uh, yeah, and tonight we're uh, having some technical difficulties. So hopefully we can get through the hour without any too without too many issues, and uh, you know, have a bit of fun along the way. Yep. Now we got um, uh, a bit to cover. We'll probably start with the uh, with the UFC on this one uh, on the weekend. The uh, again the Anzacs were were represented by New Zealand's uh, Kai Kara France, who had a, um, a incredible performance really against uh, Askar Askarov. And uh, and it has to be said here, we've got a little bit of egg on our face. We uh, we were both <laughs> probably a little bit negative about this matchup for for Kai in uh, in episode seven, but uh, you know, he rose to the challenge after a, a pretty rocky uh, rocky first round. He he found Askar Askarov on his uh, on his back and uh from there he uh you know he he did a lot of damage in the in in the second round and uh, had a close uh, close third round but uh managed to pull out a unanimous decision win so uh yeah what do you think of kai kara france's performance from the weekend um yeah i gotta admit when i was watching that first round i was kind of like oh no um i was a bit i was a bit stressed for the guys a bit worried i thought it's a wrap he's got the back and you know the you see had the control that uh Asuka had and how tight he was and how he kept trying to fish that arm through and he would switch sides and i was like oh man it's a matter of time and, and then it's a wrap but kai stayed disciplined and did what he did round two which you know you saw what you know the, the fight shift and kai was able to do what he does and land and um and and, and do some good work on the feet and you know there's a, there's a few times there where i thought Oh, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna pounce on this and then put him away because I think you heard him a few times. But Kai showed that he's, um, he was, you know, he was just disciplined and patient and kind of. You could hear Eugene yelling out, telling him to kind of like just wait and not, not, not push in too much because even if he did blitz in and there was a possibility that he was gonna land those extra shots and put him away, there's always the risk that you, you might land one or two. He grabs a hold of you and then he can just chill and recover and control you and just kind of ride out until to make it to that third round. And even though he probably won't be doing as much damage, in the eyes of the judges, he still controls you for, you know, however long he was had a hold of you. So in their eyes, they're going to be looking at going, okay, well, he still control, you know, he had control, he was in the dominant position. Um, and then again, it kind of doesn't look good despite the damage that you did. Uh, it's the lasting impression. And then you go into a third round, which potentially you could have finished the fight in the second round, you know? So it was, a, it, was a, it was a weird spot for him to be in. You know, he couldn't just rush in. If it was anyone else, like any other sort of fighter, you, you would be able to. You know, you'd be able to just rush in because you know they're not going to shoot some crazy takedown chain and take you down and put you on your back and control you. Um, and I thought the third round obviously was was still a close round, but yeah, you can see where Kai did uh, did more than Asuka. Asuka was really just looking to engage with the wrestling and really just gr- like hold on and grind it out because uh, I think he 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 was buzzed in that second round. I think he took a lot of damage, like you said. I think he yeah he ate some hard shots and the guy kind of looked like a deer in headlights a bit um in the third round but still made it a close round so yeah it was it was um it was good to see kai get the win and now it looks like he's cemented himself the next title shot so it's interesting interesting movement there and, and a good good place for, for 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 the anzac fighters again now you know taking another step forward like that absolutely and as you mentioned there um yeah, kai seems to be uh, next in line there um I, th- I think there's been talk of a of a fourth fight between uh, between Figgy and uh, and Brandon Moreno, but uh, I don't know how many times those two can fight each other. I know it's uh, I know it's one one and one, but surely they can't do four in a row. But uh, following the fight, anyway, um, uh, Figueredo is has uh, uh, taken to social media and called Kai Kara France out. He's um, which is. I guess that speaks to the momentum that Kai has at the moment. You know, he's uh, he's obviously got the the Garbrandt win under his belt. He's just beaten Askarov, and now the the champion's calling him out. So, yeah, it looks like um, 
you know, provided that, uh, that that Figueredo gets his way, then uh, you know Kai will be be next in line. So that that's huge for uh, for City Kickboxing and for for Anzac uh, MMA. Yeah, hundred percent. And like I think, yeah, Figgy said some more stuff today. I saw that he asked Anna White to skip over Marino and give the fight to Kai because he took offense to some stuff that Marino's team have been doing. I think they've been making some memes of him putting his face on a monkey's body or his a monkey's face on his body or I don't know something like that. And he's took taken offense to it. As far as trash talk goes and stuff that's been said, it's probably on the lighter side of things when you see some of the other shit that people are saying. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I can understand though. You know, the dude's frustrated. He probably doesn't want to fight Marino for a full time in a row. Even you know if he's confident he can beat him or whatever. You know, it's like, I mean, how many times can you prepare for the same bloke? Like, mm-hmm. I honestly, from a fan point of view, I'd watch them fight again, no doubt. It's been been crazy watching their fights. Like, take that second fight out of it when Marino just destroyed him. The first, you know, the first fight and the third fight close fights close fights so um and entertaining too there wasn't like any boring parts of those fights so yeah but so part of me is like all right give kai a shot but part of me is like oh we need we need them to do it one more time to get a definitive end to it and but you know marino's taking offense to some light-hearted light-hearted trash talk i'd say and doesn't want the fight with marino he wants to give it to kai and i'm all for that if that's going to give kai a title shot on the topic of trash talk though real quick as everyone knows, I'm fighting May 7th on the Gold Coast. Alan Philpot, if you're listening, you can say whatever you want to me. Go for gold. If you talk about my, my family or you talk about my kid, I'm going to break your fucking jaw. Get that in your head. Sorry, get that there out you there. Go. There you go. He's put. Uh, he's laid down the law there. Locked you off, Justin Van Heerd, and it's. Uh, has there been a bit of um, a bit of back and forth with you guys, sort of outside of the uh, the inbox? Uh, oh, there was a little bit when he was like doing his usual thing on social media. He was talking about no one wants to fight him, blah, 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 blah. Well, now you got to fight. Now there is a featherweight that's, a, you know, got to fight against you. So you can't say no one wants to fight you. So now, you know, I mean, I, it's all part of it, the old trash talk and stuff like that. But the last guy that's, you know, decided to take it a bit too far and talk about my kid, talk about my family and stuff like that. Look what I did to him. I went to his hometown and beat the shit out of him for three rounds. So... You know, that's 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 the the only outcome if you want to take it to that point. Like, I'm fair game because obviously you're fighting me, whatever. And I, you know, I can bring the banter and the trash talk just as good as anyone. And I'm the me majesty, just like Izzy says. I'm right up there. It's like Izzy and me. We're fighting for number one me maker in MMA right now. So yeah, we'll see what happens. But just keep my kid's name out of your mouth. There you go. There you go. He's been warned. And uh, yeah, for those who didn't know, May seventh on the on the Gold Coast, Eternal sixty four six. No, well, I've forgotten the number. But uh, yeah, Justin Van Heerden versus uh, versus Alan Philpot. So it's going to be um, it's, it's going to be a fun one. And uh, actually, while we're on the um, on the local scene, we uh, may as well sort of cover off a couple of things here. We uh, last week we did mention um, uh, Kevin Jusse, who's um, uh, we've you know, the name we threw out was was Matt Myers, but it's actually David Francis at, at Eternal Sixty Five. So um, <laughs> yeah, I thought we'd just cover that one off, just uh, for anyone. I know everyone was hanging out for the uh, conclusion to that conversation. So uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, David Francis is the. Um, uh, is is the opponent, and of course we'll be uh, we'll, we'll be touching on that one, and I think uh, I think I think it'll be around episode twelve. We'll be uh, we'll be previewing uh, Eternal sixty five. We'll get stuck right into that one, but uh, you know from from this weekend just past um, Rogue MMA down here in Melbourne, when it was uh, the main event was Sem Kakembo versus uh, uh, Rafael Vilches. So um, obviously a fun matchup on paper, and um, and uh, Kakembo, um, you know he's he's looked pretty good. He's improved to to three and zero. He's he's got the win over over Rafael. So what do you think of Sem and uh, and the fight with uh, with Rafael? Feel. Yeah, it was a good fight. Um, it was always going to be interesting to see what happened on the striking portion of things. Uh, Rafael was actually an old teammate of mine from my previous gym at Southside. Um, very credentialed striker, got a Muay Thai background, kickboxing, boxing, you know, so striking's very, very handy. His wrestling and grappling's come like a tremendous way. It's obviously the part of his game that he's trying to improve um, and keep improving on. And obviously, you know, on the feet, uh, when the fight was on the feet, that portion of the fight, you know, was was competitive and it was it was it was a striker's delight and it was, it was beautiful to watch. Um, and then obviously, Kakembo adjusted in the second round, got the takedown and ultimately won by rear naked choke. So, yeah, you know, um, he used to fight a bantamweight when he was an amateur. Now he's a pro. Um, he's fighting a featherweight. I'm liking what I'm seeing and so far. Obviously, he fought on the same night as me on the last Hex show, um, and he kind of you know looked. 
looked looked the goods in that fight as well. He was he was kind of you know just doing his thing, fl- flowing real well. Looks like he's getting more and more comfortable in there. He made some adjustments in that fight as well because uh, the guy he fought was was um, was tough as and just kept coming forward, kept coming forward. So you know, and now obviously he's backed it up and fought on Rogue and he and he's beat Rafael. So now you know it's interesting to see where he's moving forward. I think you know he's he's got a lot of momentum now and he's um he's uh yeah he's definitely he's definitely exciting to watch the guy puts on a show when he fights so I'm, i like watching the guy fight so i'm i'm all in with him being at, at featherweight and putting on exciting fights yeah, he's definitely making a name for himself doesn't he he looks uh, he, he looks right at home in the cage to me like he always looks so mm. just kind of composed and and just like he's uh, you know he's meant to be there another day in the office which is for someone early in their career is um you know it's a pretty good sign if someone's got that sort of uh, that that sort of composure early on. So I don't know. What, what do you reckon the um you know what, what's your what's your read on on Kikembo? What do you reckon the uh, the you know the um, potential is there? Um yeah, he's definitely a talented man. The dude's got potential to go a long long way in this game, and it looks like they're handling things the right way. That they're, they're, you know they're doing it the right way. They they're not looking to like push him into some crazy stuff straight away. Like they're built like so even through his amateur career, they were like sort of these. It's a slow build. And now, you know, now since he's gone pro and the fights he's had already, it's been good fights and the matchups have been, have been, um, have been picked really well. Like the, it's not like they've given him, it's not like the, they've, they've just fed him like a bunch of easy fights. Like the fights are tough fights for him, but they're definitely fights where it's like, there's enough danger that you kind of have to be like, Oh shit, I'm going to be on my game, but also very winnable for someone like, like him with his style and the ability that he has. So um, yeah, I like what they're doing. I like how they're approaching it. And, you know, he's got a good team behind him. He trains at Absolute. Um, you know, trains got alongside guys like Karnoff, Lee, Jack Jenkins. Um, you know, he's got he's got some 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 good training partners, good coaches behind him. So, yeah, he's definitely got the potential to um, to go far. And, and, you know, seeing the guy's demeanor and stuff like when he's at these fight shows and stuff like that, it's like you said, he looks comfortable, looks focused and just gets in there, does his thing and gets out. Yeah, absolute MMA is about as good as it gets down here, down here in Melbourne in terms of just the the depth of their fight team, and you know, yeah, like you say, it looks like they're um they're kind of just building him up gradually. So yeah, it's gonna be um it's gonna be a fun watch with Sam Kikembo. I think there's some uh, there's some real potential there for you know, for my money anyway. But uh, also on the on the local scene uh, this weekend, we've got uh, Proving Grounds uh, up on the Gold Coast as well. I think so. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, I know you're um, you're all across the, uh, the the Queensland fight scene. So uh, you know, what, what should we look out for at uh, at Proving Grounds this weekend? Yeah, there's a couple. Obviously, there's a couple of fights on that card. And what I've seen so far, what they're doing at Proving Grounds, obviously they're building it up. So they're giving these amateurs and 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 some of these you know fighters a chance to to build up some experience before ultimately they either go pro or fight on like an undercard on these eternal shows that are like getting so much so much bigger now in the stadium packed out crowds i think i saw something today that the last eternal event they had their highest gate and highest attendance so that's good to see and that shows you like where it's built to now so for proving grounds to be the sort of platform now that the fighters can build themselves up before they fight on that eternal card and then eventually start going pro you know, and, and, and you go from there. I think it's a really cool thing. So this weekend, there's um there's two fights for me that really stick out um, with some talented talented uh, fighters that are, that I can see you know being um a uh, part of a bright future for Australian MMA. So uh, the first fight there's um it's a women's flyweight fight. Uh, you got Alessandra Inacio taking on one of my teammates, Amina Hadea. So the fight's taking, taking place at flyweight. Amina's stepped up on a week's notice to, to take the fight. She just fought two weeks ago on uh, a show on Diamondback in Adelaide um, where she was at, yeah, where she won a unanimous decision there. So, you know, she's um, come out of that healthy and, and decided to, to, to take this fight and jump in. Um, Inacio is a, a talented, talented jiu-jitsu specialist. She's a purple belt jiu-jitsu, you know, a grappling uh, her, her previous fight, her last fight, she fought on Eternal, and I think it was Eternal. Yeah, it was Eternal, and she put on a show like, and was just, you know, her her whole demeanor. She came out relaxed. She was like dancing out to the cage, dancing after the fight. Was able to use her grappling and ultimately, you know, just get on top and and do what you expect a purple belt to do to someone who's not, who's someone who's potentially not on that same level of grappling um, in that capacity. So so it makes this an interesting matchup. You know, obviously. Um, Amina's training with us at freestyle, so you know, we're, you know, she trains trains under Joe, trains trains under Volk, trains alongside 
some some good people. So like, which you know, she's she's obviously looking to be well rounded. She's got a really good striking background of boxing, kickboxing, stuff like that. Has been um has been there already when she came to freestyle, but it, like across the board, her game's evolved. So I'm you know, some from a fighter from a fighting point of view, it's an interesting matchup for me because it's like a it's a classic striker versus grappler matchup on paper, but from what I've seen from both girls, their games in the other avenue, their their weak points, as you call it, or the, the the part where they lack in their game, have both elevated. So I'm going to be interested to see how that goes. So um, obviously, I'm going to back my team. I don't want to see her win, but at the same time, you know, Alessandra is no joke, and uh, you know she's got the capacity to to end the fight as soon as she gets a hold of people. So yeah, it's 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 one of those fights where it's kind of like you're going to be on edge because you're going to be like. Mm, as soon as she gets a hold of her, what's going to happen? And then if Amina's like pressing her up against Cage, land heavy shots, you know, what's going to happen there? You know, what's the adjustments that they're going to make? So that's one I'm looking forward to. Uh, the other fight's the main event. They've done really well here. So Kim and Robin, well, it's Robin. Robin's done really well to, 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 to match this fight. Uh, Jaden Dalrymple from Akai MMA is taking on Daz Kalovos from Bunchu. Uh, so Jaden's 3-1 and one in MMA. Uh, coming off a loss in his last fight on Eternal, one of the Eternal shows, he fought Alistair Volders um, and looked the goods in that fight. Uh, Alistair was able to adjust and caught him with a knee off, off, off the clinch and, and put him away. Um, and then you've got Daz Kolovos, who's 3-0 and in MMA at the moment. Guy's got a good Muay Thai background, trains at Bunchu, stepped into the MMA world now and he's looked the goods since he's been, you know, since he's been in the cage. Um, he's obviously got Daniel Almeida that's helping him with the MMA and, and um wrestling uh side of things and jiu-jitsu side of things but you know then he's got wayne and angie parr that are coaching him with with, with the stand-up so it's a, it's a dynamite combination and we've seen these bunchu fighters come out and, and and do quite well so far um so whatever they're doing up there it's, it seems to be working um jaden's a blue belt in jiu-jitsu he's, he's he's very well rounded uh trains under da- under david garnham up in Mackay, as i said um, so you know, fair experience. Dave's one of the pioneers of Australian MMA. He's my first, he's my first MMA coach. Fun fact there, for people that might not know. But the lockjaw came from humble beginnings in Mackay, North Queensland. Um, yeah. So this fight's going to be a cracker. They've done well on paper. This fight matches up amazingly. You got three, you got two guys who are similar experience. Two guys who've well-rounded. Um, both guys, you know, pack some power. Both guys look for finishes um so yeah that's going to be a crazy fight to watch and and the both both guys as well seem to have composure of seasoned pros when you see them in there they're early into they're early into their their fight careers and, and their amateur careers in that capacity but both of them look super composed when they're out there and um you know i've had the pleasure of sharing the mats with Jaden early on before he even started fighting and i watched that kid develop and grow and build and just keep getting better and better you know, as a young kid, when he come into the uh, into the gym up there, you know, and then now he's grown into this like young, confident um, guy that's just coming out here and putting on amazing fights. You know, even though he didn't get the result in his last fight, up until he, he got caught with that knee, it was not looking good for Alistair. So, this if you're uh, wondering what fights you need to be tuning in for and thinking if you need to start getting behind some of these amateurs, definitely start watching these shows. Because you're seeing these kids come out and put on shows like they're seasoned professionals. And that's what we want to see. So that's another fight that you want to keep an eye out for. Absolutely. There you go. And uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting watch with uh, with Boonshu. Obviously, their uh, MMA program is relatively recent. And uh, you know, guys like Kolovos coming through and... Um yeah, like you say, they're sort of looking the goods early on, so it's going to be interesting to see what they can do. Obviously, with uh, yeah, the Muay Thai side of things is uh, certainly well, well, well catered over there, and uh, yeah, the MMA team is is growing by the day, so it's going to be a fun watch as well. But yeah, Jaden Dalrymple is um, obviously a, a likely type as well, so that's going to be like you say, that's a brilliant matchup for um, you know for the top of an amateur card that could be. Uh, yeah, that, that wouldn't look out of place on an Eternal show, uh, you know, like a full Eternal show. So, um, yeah, it's a, some good matchmaking there. It's definitely definitely worth a watch. 100%. All right. Now, um, we'll probably we'll, we'll head offshore now. Um, on the weekend, we, of course, uh, as we previewed last week, John Wayne Parr uh, fought for the, the final time in, uh, in one championship. And... Uh, Unfortunately, it didn't go his way. You know, it was it was pretty uh pretty pretty heartbreaking, really, for uh, for most uh, you know combat sports fans. You know, for those who don't know, John Wayne Parr was uh, was stuck on ninety nine 
uh, wins in Muay Thai. And uh, in his last fight, he was going for number 100. He took on uh, Edward uh, Foley Young, who's a, a former one uh, MMA uh, champion, uh, this time under Muay Thai rules. And uh, unfortunately, he, he's come up short. He got um, he got put down in the uh, in the second round, I think. And um, you know, he's just. He, he wasn't really able to uh, to sort of make it back up. He it, well, he made it up, but he, he wasn't able to uh, sort of turn the fight around really from there. He uh, you know, he, he hurt Foley Young in the in the last minute there, but um, yeah, wasn't able to put him away. And yeah, unfortunately, he's uh, he's walked away um, on the wrong end of the decision. So uh, yeah, what did you make of uh, John Wayne Parr's performance? Oh man, <laughs> hit me right in the fucking in the feels there, man. I wanted to see that dude win and get that hundred wins and then just sail off, but. Uh... Yeah, obviously, it was uh, it was not the desired outcome. You know, I still feel like you know, like you said, he's that like he said in the lead up when he spoke to you, like he's that old guy in the sport now, and you're kind of like, man, what happened? But like he said himself, you got to be you got to be wary of someone who's old and still fighting in a young man's game. And man, there was moments in that fight where he still showed that he's John Wayne Parr and he's a ten time world champion in Muay Thai. And like like you said towards the end there, they looked. I mean, it looked like he was going to do it. It looked like he was going to he was going to get it, but um, yeah, just didn't go his way, unfortunately. But um, still crazy to to think that that guy is was going for his hundredth win, but he's already had like north of a hundred fights um over this time, and he's won multiple world titles, and we're still watching him fight. You know, now I remember like I started watching John Wayne Parr when I was a kid, and then I really started seeing um the like support and stuff increase again when he was on the contender series not contender series the contender i think it was just called the contender, yeah, contender asia. Yeah. yeah yeah contender asia or whatever and you know he fought yods and clay on that as well so you know the guy's just he's been around and he's just out here just laying the pathway for these young up-and-coming fighters and now he's, he's like we said with prince who starting to dip their toe in the mma world you know who knows what's going to happen we're going to we're going to see him sort of branch out now into that coaching capacity and um yeah, there's some there's some things ahead for the guy, but damn, I really wanted to see him get that hundredth win. You know, who knows? Is he really retired? You know, this isn't his first time retiring. Yeah, um, he's had a few attempts. So, part yeah, of me, part of me is like, okay, he's decided he's done, he's done, and I love when fighters can do that themselves. But part of me is just like, man, get another cage Muay Thai card going and fight someone on that and bash them, get that hundredth win, and then we're done. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know what? I think I'll, I'll just about put my hand up just to get in the cage and just let him bash me to get number one hundred. There you go. I feel that. I feel like I, there's I, a people, I just wanted to get people. it that badly. Really, it was. Uh, it was. You know, in that last minute, I was just hoping he was going to get it over the line. That would have been just a fairy tale thing. But a hundred percent. If he'd have, if he'd have head kicked old mate and put his head into the front row, I would have been stoked. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, like, like you say, it, like it was obviously a, a heartbreaking scene. There was tears in the cage afterwards. He he left his his gloves behind. And actually, I, I did put it to him um, when I in, in my interview. For those who haven't watched it, it's on the uh, Fight News Australia YouTube channel. But uh, I did put it to him. I said, you know, in the event that you don't win, would you be tempted to come back for number one hundred? And to be honest. It wasn't an emphatic answer. <laughs> so obviously, like, you know, this is a guy who just loves fighting. You know, he loves everything about it. And obviously, just Father Time has caught up with him there. And um, yeah, obviously, the, the hip issues and things like that. But uh, I think he's one of those guys, if he had it his way, he would just fight forever. So, you 100%. know, you, you couldn't put it past him. But, uh, you know, it really is time. Like, he, he looked, you know, it looks off the pace, you know, like... Uh, he kind of looked like he was struggling to pull the trigger at times. You know, we've seen it with uh, with fighters as they get older. You know, they have trouble, you know, just keeping up and 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 throwing punches and landing punches when they need to. And probably, particularly in the early part of the fight, he probably you know he looked a little bit off the pace. So you know, Father Time is uh, as as he said himself is undefeated mm. and. Um, you know, but but what a career! Like you say, 10, 10 uh, Muay Thai world titles. Uh, there's 134 fights in the end in in Muay Thai. Um, uh, 14 fights in boxing, including a, a national title. Um, you know, just a first ballot Hall of Fame. I don't even know if we have a Hall of Fame in, here in Australia, but we should probably create one to put John Wayne Parr in there because uh, just yeah, what a career! And um, you know, I, I don't think uh, you know he's lost any any sort of shine through a, a performance like that. But. The other thing to keep in mind is obviously, you know, the guy like we know he had a hip replacement and all that sort of stuff, but the guy's hardly going to come out and be like, oh, no, nah, actually, you know what? My body's actually more destroyed and I've got a bunch of things that I'm struggling with. Like he's, he's, he's never been that type of guy. If you followed along in his career, I'm sure he fought 
completely injured lots of times. So who knows, you know, like you said, you know, who knows what the guy, like who knows what the guy's really got going on, you know, obviously his hip, so so he got a hip surgery, got a hip replacement that got sorted. But like, you know, that the guys, who knows, man, the guy's hands have been broken so many times over the years. He's had so many injuries. You've seen how many times that guy's had stitches and stuff like that. You know, ultimately the guy, you know, could have been struggling with a lot more that he's just not decided to bring out into the public eye. So who knows? So to get still get in there and get, you know, get after it and try and go for it. It's just, yeah, it's crazy to see. And, and, and yeah, I'm stoked that we still, it, it was 2022 and we still got to see John Wayne Parr jump in and fight. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a privilege to see any time you get to see someone like that in the cage, you know, regardless of sort of how long in the tooth they are or what the what the situation is. But uh, yeah, it was a privilege to see him in the in the cage one last time. And, um, you know, we wish him well in retirement. And he's got, uh, you know, he's, like you say, he's got plenty of work to do with his uh, with his gym. You know, his kids are competing. He's, they've got a, you know, they're building an MMA team there. So, uh, you know, his his knowledge and experience and, um, you know, his, his character isn't going to be lost to the sport. So that's, uh, that's certainly a positive there. But for um, his opponent, uh, you know, Edward Foley Young, for, for his part, actually, I, ha- I do have to say, I, I think I might have said uh, in last week's episode that Foley Young's 41 years old. Um, he's actually 37, so uh, apologies to Edward <laughs> Foley Young. Um, <laughs> so he, he's not, not as old as I thought. So um, obviously, uh, you know, Foley Young, he, like, like everyone else he pro- in the MMA community, he probably listens to this podcast, so apologies, Edward. <laughs> Edward. 100%. Yeah, but um, but he he looked good in the fight, you know. Um, Foley Young, he's he's had his problems in in Muay Th- in uh, pardon me in MMA. He's uh, I think he's one and six in his last seven starts. But uh, you know he, he looked good in the fight. He he looked um he looked much younger, much sharper. Um, you know, but it, it felt like he could fight with a little bit more freedom in in Muay Thai. Like he's obviously from a striking background himself, and uh, mm. you know, he looked pretty good. I don't I don't mind the uh, the look of him in Muay Thai. So um yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to see him uh, see him fight again. What do you reckon? Yeah, I'd I'd, have, I'd be happy to see him stay in the striking 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 only side of things, you know, in the super series or whatever they call it with the little gloves, or even in the straight kickboxing stuff that they got going, or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think yeah, like you're spot on there, you know. He was a, uh, you know, wasn't worried about getting taken down, so he could just open up a bit more and have a bit more fun and flow on a bit more. So, um, yeah, I think he can still. There's some dope matchups you could do for him in that capacity of things, and you know you could um, he could still be very entertaining and, and put on some good fights. So, yeah, I'm all for that. I'm all for for one championship sort of cashing in on that and doing and doing something like that. Just That's don't match him with Nikki Holskin. We don't need to see that. We don't need to see that. Yeah, well, uh, Nikki Holskin got stopped on the card actually as well. He, um, yeah, so that was a that was a bit of a shocker because uh, yeah, that guy was a gun. But uh, yeah, Nikki Holskin's probably a bridge too far. But uh, there's certainly some fun matchups in the in the striking realm for um, for Edward Foley Young. So that'd be um, yeah, that, that, that'd be fun. But uh, you know, actually, while we're talking about one. I, I love one championship, right? I've made no secret of this on this uh, on this podcast, but. Um, we we saw another forty six year old uh, fighting on that card. I don't know if you watched the whole uh, one championship card, but um, Yoshihiro Akiyama fought uh, Shinya Aoki. Um, yeah, he was a mm-hmm. former UFC veteran, uh, Akiyama. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know we've uh, we, we've talked about this before, right? But uh, and I, I don't want to harp on about it too much. But uh, you can't tell me that. Yoshihiro Akiyama has pissed into a cup before that uh, before that fight. There, I said it. <laughs> he is the most jacked and most tanned 46 year old in MMA. I'll tell you that. There's <laughs> something going on there. Um, Holy moly. They, they call him sexy armor for a reason. That dude, I don't know, but he looks the goods. Like, I'm 28. That dude looks better than me. Like, I, if I was in a room with, 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 with him and we were taking a photo and they were like, all right, we're taking a photo after the session, I'm keeping my shirt on. Fuck that. That guy, I don't know. He's, he's got something going on. He, he looks oh, the goods. Yeah. Oh, did he ever? That, that is a forty. We thought Bibiano Fernandez looked huge in his fight against John Lineker, but uh, Yoshihiro Hiro Akiyama looked like he was about to pop. He's <laughs> he's he was so jacked. Uh, it was uh, yeah, out of control. He's like, like Yoa Romero. It's like Yoa Romero jacked. Like, it makes no sense. 
Yeah, that was unreal. He hasn't gotten any uh, any less sexy since his uh, since his UFC uh, tenure, that's for sure. And uh, he picked up a big win over Aoki as well. There was there was clearly a size difference between the two of them. Um, we know Akiyama is a former middleweight, and Aoki sort of fights around lightweight normally, but uh, there was definitely a size difference. So, it, but it was <laughs> still an upset, you know. Aoki's a, a title contender in one, and and Akiyama's, you know, he's a legend, but uh, you know he's forty six years old, so he's mostly old in novelty fights. But uh, yeah, that was. Um, uh, that was on my mind throughout through that whole fight there, um, but yeah, there you go. One championship. It's always a it's always a spectacle. Uh, drug testing or no no drug testing. It's uh, you know it's always fun to watch. A hundred percent. And the just real quick before we move on from that. Also, if people didn't see it, go and do yourself a favor and Google the photo of Rod Tang lifting up DJ in the cage. That is one day I want someone to look at me the way Rod Tang looks at Demetrius Johnson. It was it was quite nice. <laughs> bit of a uh, bit of bit of broke back there, was it? Yeah, it was, I don't know. It was it was a strange scene. Like even Demetrius after the fight and his whole just the whole it was weird. The whole thing was just weird. Like we talked about the PFL contract picking ceremony being weird. The post fight situation after that fight was just super weird. So if you haven't seen it, go look at it. <laughs> I guess it was a bit of a weird concept, wasn't it? The mixed rules sort of thing that they were doing with um, with with uh, Demetrius and 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 Rod Tang, and uh, yeah, I guess it kind of played out as you would as you'd expect, you know. Um, Demetrius kind of um, you know weathered the storm in the first round, and then pretty much took him down and choked him in the in the second when it changed to MMA rules. But uh, yeah, they're not not afraid to try something different in one championship. No, hundred percent. And I will give Rod Tang credit, man. He looked good. Even when he was def- like he knew what he was doing, it wasn't like he was just panicking. He was fighting the arm, he was pulling it over his head, he was trying to do all the right things. Obviously, the skill discrepancy was too big, but he was doing some things. So the guys obviously, you know, doing some stuff in the in the MMA capacity. Yeah, I believe uh, Rod Tang's been uh, training for a um, for a transition over to MMA for for a while now, so um, he should have some skills there. But obviously, he's up against one of one of the greats, you know, in, uh, the in MMA circles. So uh, you know, it was obviously going to be a a bridge too far really in, a, in an MMA capacity but uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if Rod Tang does actually make a permanent move uh, over because uh, he's exciting to watch he was, uh, I've, I'd like, I'm, I'm tuning in to watch that guy lace up the gloves I don't care uh, what uh, yeah, what rule set it is so yeah 100% to watch. now <clears throat> while we're um Overseas, we'll uh, we'll probably touch on boxing here. Um, we had a couple of Australian representatives overseas. Um, uh, first of all, uh, e- Ebony Bridges was uh, is a uh, you know the the newest Australian uh, world boxing champion. Uh, she's won the IBF world title over Maria Cecilia Roman uh, on the weekend. So it's only her ninth fight. She's um, she's beaten Roman, who's uh, was I think in her seventh or eighth defense. I think she's held the title mm-hmm. for around five years. So. You know, a lot is said about Ebony Bridges, right? Obviously, the, there's the the social media and the the weigh-ins, and you know, everyone laughs about like Eddie Hearn trying to you know um, direct his gaze elsewhere while she weighs in and and that sort of thing. But uh, you know, she can she can really fight. Like she's shown on the weekend, she's she's won a world title, and and she's not afraid to scrap. She came up against someone who was probably a more experienced boxer and probably a little bit uh, more skilled in terms of boxing. But, uh, you know, she's, she's not afraid to, to make it ugly and to, to throw down and, and scrap. And she's, uh, you know, she's done a great job in, in winning the world title. So did you, did you catch um, Ebony's fight from the weekend? Yeah. And like, you know, I think a lot of people wrote her off going into this fight. You know, I saw a bunch of stuff where people like boxing analysts specifically were kind of like, oh, well, you know, this is going to be another defense for the champ and she's just going to do what she does and what she's been able to do. But, yeah, I think you, 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 you're spot on there. You know, she, she made it she made it a dogfight. She made it gritty and just got after it. So, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, if someone's more skilled, more experienced, but they're just not willing or able to, you know, fight through someone who's making it a dogfight and just getting after it and willing to stand in the fire and get after it, then eventually you're going to see them, you know, not be able to hang with that and they're going to crumble. And that's kind of what you saw there. You know, she was able to just to, to make it, take the fight and, and put it into an avenue where it was her world and like she could find the success. And, you know, we saw the champ kind of look confused and kind of there's a few moments there where you're kind of like, where you saw her kind of freeze up a little bit and then start wearing some shots. And, and it was just, it's just, the case of yeah just making it an ugly fight that was that was another one of those fights where if it was if 
if the fight looked like it was technical and like like super technical and there was a lot of ra- like work from range or you know you know then you'd be going okay well you know the champion's just kind of just using using her boxing ability and kind of just point fighting away to a to, to a win and kind of just doing what she does but that's not what you saw there you saw a scrap so it was cool to watch absolutely and you know she's kind of as I, as I sort of touched on there she's kind of been seen as a little bit of a sideshow I think you know I, I know there's, there's always questions when uh, um, you know someone like Ebony sort of has the the blonde hair and the you know the the physique and all that sort of stuff gets signed to a, a promoter like Eddie Hearn people sort of say well you know it's just a, a sideshow she's there for her looks and that sort of thing so it was really good to see her pull out the win and really just legitimize herself as a as a fighter and kind of step out of this uh, you know this crap that goes on on uh, you know on social media so um, yeah huge win for Australian boxing and for, for Ebony bridges another yeah like you said another champion so australia seems to be we're just you know rising up in the combat sports so we're just gonna keep you know you'll see you got you got cambosis you got tim zoo you got all these people rising up you know there's uh not just in that you know mma capacity as well as the boxing side of things we're starting to see these aussies come up and start taking over you've got someone like liam para who's on the cusp of a world title shot you got someone like isaac hardman who's fighting zarafa he beats the winner of that fight. They, they become a mandatory challenger for a world title. Um, you've got obviously Cambosis, who's the king. Uh, you know, going to be de- defending all his belts against, you know, some of these top top contenders that you could potentially see. Um, so it's just rising up across the board. So you love to see it. Absolutely, and uh, Sky, Nichol- Sky Nicholson was uh, in action on the weekend as well. Is also signed to um, to Eddie Hearn. She's only in her second pro fight. She obviously made a name for herself in the in the Olympics. I think she yep. might have come fourth or something like that. But uh, you know, there was the the scene of her, um, you know, sort of missing out on a medal there. But uh, you now she's uh, she's shown that she can, she can adapt to the pro ranks, and she picked up her second win on the on the weekend as well. So um, yeah, it's just another prospect to add to the add to the list. But there's a real movement in Australian boxing at the moment, and it's uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, look, like, if you're, you know, if you're someone who who who's kind of like not, you know, you haven't been sort of following along with the boxing sort of scene here in, in in Australia, and you're not you're not really sure, I definitely suggest that you start getting involved and start getting the muscle because there's some talented individuals. And if you're someone who likes the sport, but you you know you kind of went away from it because it kind of did for, you fade a bit and dip away there for a bit, and you're kind of like, whatever, I don't really. You know, I don't really care, but you know, now's the time to get back involved and start watching some of these fighters. You've got, you've got some cracking fights happening here in Australia, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna keep seeing these people get to a world stage and start doing well. Like, it's just, it's just a given. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it's a good time to jump on board, as you say. And uh, obviously, one of our one of our brightest stars at the moment is uh, is Tim Zhu. He was in the, in action on the weekend. Um, against uh, Terrell Gachet, who's a uh, you know, former Olympian. Um, I think he's unranked at the moment, Gachet, but uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a step up. Like, uh, Tim Zhu has been, uh, been sort of built up really gradually. Like it, every fight that he's had has been just a step up in class. You know, there was Dennis Hogan who was a step up and then uh, Takeshi Inoue was sort of a step up from Dennis Hogan. And obviously now he's on to um, Terrell Gachet, but um, you know, he, he, he uh, was put down in the first round. Uh, just sort of looked a little bit dicey there. It, it looked like a little <laughs> bit of a flash knockdown to me. Um, he, he looked like he was still sort of alert, but uh, you know, Tim Zhu, he, he recovered quickly and and uh, managed to push the pace for the rest of the first round. And then from then on, he sort of did what what, what Tim Zhu does. We talked about this off air before um, before we recorded tonight. But uh, you know, he kind of just he just breaks people down. He just pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, and uh, you know, Gachet really seemed to fade pretty quickly under under the pressure, and um, you know, so it was a it was a, it was a big performance from uh, from Tim Zhu in the end in his in his US debut, and uh, you know, so yeah, what did you what did you make of it? Yeah, I was. I mean, when he got yeah when he got cracked in the first round, I was kind of like, oh, you know, this is going to spoil your US debut here, and like we're we're all over here in Australia hyping up how good Tim Zhu is, and then. He goes over there and he gets dropped in the first round. I'm thinking, oh, no, this is not what we want. But, um, yeah, like you said, he adjusted real well, was able to come back. And then he just, you know, just showed how good he is and just showed how disciplined he is and how reserved he is and ultimately showed his his, his, his IQ when it comes to the sport of boxing is very high. Um, obviously, he's always going to have big expectations when he fights moving forward, and especially now that he's been introduced to that sort of international and U.S. audience, I'd say. People are going to compare him with his dad and it's just always just going to be, you know, big shoes for him to fill. But, 
you know, if anything, the guy is showing that he's perfectly capable of doing that. He's, um, yeah, as a, as, a, as someone who's a fan of the sport of boxing, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's someone that you, you definitely need to start getting, getting on board with. If you're not on board with already, he's, he's tremendous to watch and definitely see him winning multiple world titles moving forward, like a hundred percent. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I mean, like Terrell Gachet, just to, to put it into context, he's, uh, you know, he's only had two losses on his record and they were to Erislandi Lara and, uh, Erickson Lubin. So it was, um, yeah. you know, this, this is a guy who, who knows how to fight. Um, you know, and, and it was a near disaster in the first round, as you mentioned there, like that would have just been the worst <laughs> outcome possible to just bring this guy over to the U S with all this hype, you know, being talked about in the, you know, in the same, um, in the same breath as some of the biggest names in the, in the division and to see him get, uh, stopped in the first round would have just been an absolute nightmare. But, um, <clears throat> he, he revealed after the fight that he was actually ill and, uh, he had a some sort of a like a respiratory sort of illness, and he had trouble making weight as well. So yeah, it might have uh, maybe potentially explained a, a bit of the the slow start. But um, yeah, I, I think we probably saw some um, saw some defensive holes there. Um, he, he did get uh, did get cracked a few times, but you know, boxing is a cutthroat sport. If you you know if um, so, say if, if you take a loss, particularly early in your career, it really can set you back. You know, it's not like MMA where you can just lose a bunch of fights on the come up, and then you, all all you need is to string a few wins together, and you're back in the conversation. But in boxing, once you've got a, a loss or two on your record, it really just sends you tumbling down the rankings. So, you know, did I, I guess did um, you know if if you almost lose, you know, even if you don't lose in boxing, if you get sort of uh, exposed in any sort of way, you know, like getting dropped in the first round, like like Tim Zhu did. You know, it, people start to ask questions, which is kind of unreal, really. But um, you know, I, I guess do you, do you feel like Tim Zhu's uh, stock would have risen or, or or fallen, or sort of where do you feel like his his stock is after the after the Gachet fight? Yeah, I feel like the, the you know the fans, boxing fans, boxing analysts, boxing promoters, everyone involved in the sport of boxing is going to be harsh when it comes to stuff like that. Like you said, you know, the big thing in boxing is you build for, they build these fighters up. You want to be undefeated, undefeated and just keep building them up. And then eventually, you know, they get into the mix of fighting one of these contenders and they get a mix for a title. And, you know, that's sort of how they do it. They've got all the different sort of things with the IBF, the WO, WA, all that sort of shit. So you kind of like, you know, the, but like you said, you know, if you lose a fight, then it's like, even though you might've just, you know, lost okay you were 17 and oh you lost that fight you're 17 and one you're one of the best boxers on planet earth everyone in the sport just writes you off and just goes nah they're done um so yeah i mean from for, for, for the fans he has like here you know and stuff like that i feel like the the it's you know risen again but definitely i think that for the u.s fans and the u.s sort of boxing community it's kind of like yeah but the, the, i guarantee you they'd still be like well, a bit unsure so once he fights again if he comes out there and just starches whoever he's meant to fight and comes in all good doesn't have any issues with making weight or any problems i feel like that's going to boost him right back up so yeah i feel like yeah it's a it's a hard one with boxing you kind of have to be flawless 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 and then continue that throughout otherwise you know people kind of start going mm, we're not sure um and it's it, which is kind of weird because like like people it's like people forget that um, you know, people's accomplishments and credentials leading up into that point. Like, you know, it happened to everyone, you know, everyone is like all, on, all you know, all in 100% being like, man, this person's amazing. Then they lose and then they're kind of like, oh, no, man, I, I knew he was, was going to lose. He's always, he's done. I don't want to, you know, I want to hear about that person. It happened to Ali, it happened to Tyson, it happened to everyone. The smart people got out before it happened to them. You know, the Andre Wards, the Floyd Mayweathers. They did it the right way, you know. Andre Ward. I always tell people if you're, I tell people if you're a boxer and you're, you're in the sport of boxing and you want to know how you should handle your career, watch what Andre Ward did. Got in there, won two world titles, and then he was like 30 and went, "I'm done. I'm out," and sailed off into the sunset. And that's it. So, you know, there's, there's if if you if you're gonna go down that sport of boxing, which is ruthless, and um, in and out of the ring, um, yeah, you've got to you've got to do some things the right way. Otherwise, it's just gonna uh, come back and buy you which while we're on that topic i don't know if you saw the fight between billy dib and jacob ng um obviously billy dib former former ibf featherweight title holder um yeah that fight ended up ended up uh, ending in a uh, in a silly way because um 
Billy did went to the Algermain Sterling School of Acting and decided to pretend like he was hurt after being <laughs> dropped on his head because he's a fucking moron. Um, how, how are you going to hit someone after the bell and act like a turkey when they're doing their walk to the ring, get into the ring, and you're like, and you're doing all that sort of antics and stuff like that? You act like a turkey at the press conference, and then you start getting bashed in the fight and start, you know, trying to trying to do these, I guess you just call them like shitty, dirty tactics and. Jacob, who has fought not only in boxing, the dude used to fight Muay Thai and all sorts. He's very credentialed combat sports athlete. Just dropped you on your head because you're acting, you acting silly and then you had a little sook and cried about it. So um, if anyone in the boxing world or boxing sport wants to write anyone off or give someone some shade, throw it at Billy Dib because he's a moron. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Jacob NG, is, uh, you know, he looks a good prospect. He's... Uh... You know, he's a showman. He's a, and and he can fight as well. So I think there's some real potential there. But uh, yeah, Billy Dibb's a guy who's who's at the end of his career. Really, I think he's probably 34 or 35. You know, he's a former world champion. So as as you mentioned, so people like that, they're never far away from. Uh, from another world title shot when you're a former champion in boxing you really just have to come back and and reel off a couple of wins and then you can be it it, it can be um maybe someone at the at the end of their career or is getting a little bit older is um you know is, is right for the picking you know if, if they ra- they get ranked quite easily and people can people will pick them out because they've got a name they're not necessarily that dangerous cherry picking is something that happens in boxing it's just the reality 100 percent I think Billy did recognise that uh, you know a loss to a to an up and coming guy like Jacob Ng is probably going to um, scupper any chance that he has of uh, sort of one last payday before he rides off into the sunset. So potentially that was um, you know that, that could be an explanation for what happened there. You know he's obviously he's come away. I don't know if it was it a DQ in the end. Did it go down as a, a DQ or yeah? I can't yeah. remember what the result was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So he comes away with the win on paper. And, uh, you know, he lives to fight another day in terms of, uh, you know, contending for, for titles or for, for big fights. So, um, unfortunately, that's a, you know, it's a sad reality in boxing, some of those, uh, some of those situations. And, yeah, that was no different. It's unfortunate. And, Billy, if you're watching this, because you are, because everyone watches Fight Talk Down Under, you're not missing do. it. I know he's got his notifications turned on. He's subscribed on YouTube. If you're upset about what I said, Billy, just remember, you're a boxer. I'm an MMA fighter. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely there you go um but yeah back back to tim zoo I, I guess we to, just to cover that off like uh i guess one thing i wanted to cover off was like one of one of the big questions uh, often posed to an undefeated fighter as tim zoo is is how do they deal with adversity right mm. so mm. obviously tim zoo's been dropped in the first round with uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times there against terrell gachet and for me, he, he passed with flying colours, you know, like he came up against an, an Olympian, uh, you know, obviously a guy who knows how to punch you right on the jaw and he got dropped. You know, that happens in boxing, you know, it's not, he's not the first guy to get dropped in the first round and I'm sure he won't be the last. And, um, you know, for me, he, he passed with flying colours. So I, I don't really understand why, obviously that it's maybe there shows some defensive holes in there, but uh, for me, I... I we probably am only even more impressed with Tim Zhu really after that mm. uh, after that performance. What do what, what do you reckon? Yeah, I reckon he adjusted beautifully. I mean, obviously, you know, I can speak from experience here. I've been cracked and had to do that myself. And sometimes it's, you know, you've overcome that adversity and you kind of you know rally up and 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 get the win or you know do the do the deed. But other times, you know, that doesn't happen. So to see him sort of bounce back and then perform the way he did for the rest of the fight especially considering, you know, if he was ill and he was really struggling to make weight, that explains why he got, you know, when he did get cracked, he got dropped. Obviously, you sure can punch. Like, the guy's, the guy's, the guy can crack. So, um, yeah, I'm super impressed by it. I think that's, yeah, like, the guy's allowed to have an off night. I think, you know, that's the thing with boxing. You know, people are undefeated and people just expect him to be perfect all the time. You're allowed to have an off night. I mean, like, we don't. We're not sitting here like this. We, we've all saw the fights, you know, with Tyson Fury and, and Wilder. We didn't sit there and go, oh, like after the fact, go, oh, well, Tyson got dropped and like, you know, well, what, what if? And, oh, he looked, you know, he looked beatable there and he's human. People were just on like, oh, he had an off moment and look, he adjusted and came back. So for some reason, I just see that with like Australian fighters in boxing and in just and across the board. They're not given that same sort of, I guess, respect or admiration that some of these other people get and it's it's a weird thing to see because anyone that's 
doing what's what the stuff that Tim Zoo is doing, performing the way he's performing. Like you said, he's constantly stepping up in class and just in levels and keeps going. You know, and like you said, this time was a step up in level. The first round, you watch that first round of that fight, you're like, ooh, I don't know. Like he just, he's, he's, you're like, holy crap, okay, is he going to come back? Is he going to bounce back? And he did. And then, you, you know, but people are talking about the fact that he got dropped. I'm seeing a bunch of people like boxing analysts and, and people talking about the fact that he got dropped in the first round. They're like, oh, you know, this there's stuff there that we can, t- if your future opponents can be able to utilize or whatever the case may be. But they're not talking about the fact that from round two onwards, he just bashed the bloke, like picked him apart, made him look made him look silly, an Olympian. He made an Olympian look silly. And we're not talking about that. Um, mm. Yeah, so it's a weird one for me. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I guess speaking of uh, of stepping up in class, uh, we you know we know that Tim Zhu was uh, was ranked number one in the WBO going into this fight. I think he's uh, three in the IBF and uh, and the WBC from uh, what I've got in my notes there. Unranked in the WBA, which is an interesting one, but um, we know that he's the. Uh, uh, the the mandatory uh, mandatory challenger for the WBO title, uh, which is held by Brian Castaño, who's um, who's rematching with uh, Jamel Charlo. Uh, they fought yep. to a split draw last year. Um, I think the likely scenario is that he's going to get stuck in a bit of a log jam there because, um, like, Castaño and Charlo are fighting for all the chocolates, right? Um, you know, Charlo has the IBF, WBA, WBC, and the and the you know the lineal title. Castaño has got the WBO, so. Uh, they're going to unify all the belts. Those uh, those two, or you know, one of them is whoever whoever wins the fight. And what what tends to happen in that scenario is in, in boxing, in modern day boxing, it's difficult to hold on to all the titles because all four of the major yeah. organisations will have yeah. their own mandatory challenges. So Tim Zhu is probably not going to be the top of the heap. He's uh, you know obviously the mandatory in the WBO, so he might have to uh, you know continue to bide his time and 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 build his name in the. Um, uh, in the US, but uh, you know th- th- they will have the option. Um, whoever wins that fight will have the option to fight him or potentially drop the belt. They might even get an extension for unifying all the belts if they want to fight and you know take a, a um, I guess a voluntary defense uh, in the meantime. But uh, you know the the winner of the of that fight is is obviously the the best fighter in that division at the moment. Do you think um, you know Tim Zhu? Uh, is, is ready to match it with someone on that level uh, at this point, or do you think he needs to bide his time for a little bit longer? I'd like to see him have like maybe two, three more fights before we start talking about him fighting one of those guys. Um, and then, but you know, I think if he, if he does the same thing with the, like that, he has a, like three more fights, takes a step up each time like he has been doing. And then, yeah, there's, there's no, you know, there's no reason to doubt the dude if he can do that and build himself up a bit more. Um, which you know that's what it's that's what it's about, and that's what it seems like him and his team are doing. So, I feel like yeah, you can definitely you know, you look at the guy. He's obviously he's super talented. The guy can the guy can box. So, um, you know, I'm going to back him with whoever he's going to whoever he gets put in there with. But I'd like to see him you know have a couple more fights and then and then you know throw him yeah throw him in the mix there for some for for, for that for whether it's for all the all the belts or one of the belts or whatever the case is, just get him in there. Absolutely, he's not shy in uh, in sort of calling the names of the uh, of, of the champions there. But um, you know, so far he's been shown to really not be in any rush, and his team's been pretty good at building him up slowly. So you know, there's there's mm. plenty of good names in that in the division there to, for him to keep building his name. And I think it makes sense for him to keep building his name in the US and try and string together some wins. You know, maybe someone like Austin Trout, who's uh, who's in that division. He's sort of uh, you know an older, sort of not old. You know, he's probably in his mid thirties, ex world champion. Yeah, that would probably be another step up in class as well, and someone who's, yep. who's probably beatable with a, with a name. So that would probably be a good one. Um, you know, he's had his he's had a bit of a back and forth with Tony Harrison. There was sort of talk that the fight might have been close to being signed and then uh, not happening, and then you know, it obviously didn't happen. So someone like that would also probably be an, another step up and uh, you know, another fun one. So. You know, hopefully he can get some fights like that. You know, and and uh, mm. sort of work his way up. Um, and then potentially, you know, he could probably lure um, one of the big dogs um, back to Australia, you know, like um, he's obviously got a huge name value here in Australia, although I, I did read that he might have earned seven figures over in the US for fighting Gachet. But uh, obviously, you know, he'd be able to do a big stadium show here in Australia and they'd be, be able to offer a competitive purse to one of the champions to, uh, you know, to come back here to, to Australia. So um, no, yeah, well- it's going to be interesting to see what his next move is. A hundred percent. And if you're going to do, you know, you've got Ken Bosa who, who said without a doubt he wants to defend his belts in Australia when he fights. 
you, know, you could put you could do a cracker you know, a cracker boxing card. You know, you could you could do that. You could for sure chuck Tim Zhu and and Cambosis on 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 a similar sort of card, and you know that's going to sell out. You do that at Marvel Stadium, it's going to pack it out. Um, Absolutely, and yeah, you know, that's kind of rare in boxing as well. Those sort of uh, world title double he- double headers. They're normally sort of more um, more like tent pole type events where they have the mm. they have they have a big. Um, you know, world title at the top of the card, and then the rest is kind of uh, kind of populated with uh, sort of less significant fights. But yeah, that would be that would, it. Would certainly be um, probably out of character for for boxing to put on a, a double header like that. But geez, wouldn't that be a mega event? Just uh, yeah, Marvel Stadium or something would be would be incredible. Hundred percent, it's and it would sell out. hundred percent, it would sell out. And you could fill that card with Australian boxing's talent. You know, it's top talents that you got out there. The people we spoke about before, the Jacob and G's, the Liam Parrows. You know, you got these guys that are, you know, that could, that are, that have the uh, good support base here in, in Australia that you could get on on a card like that where you have some of these world championship caliber fighters on that are going to, you know, help build it up and rise it up even more. So, I mean, it's a win win in my books. But as you said, boxing's a weird one, and they they, they don't really yeah, don't really sort of do stuff like that. But um, see what happens. Absolutely, and uh, and and the, the place to find all the uh, all the analysis of, of such a card, if it were to happen, would of course be Fight Talk Down Under. We'll be up to episode fifty something by then, probably. Um, and the only way to stay up with that is to like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean. Keep an eye on fightnewsaustralia.com dot com as well. Um, episode nine is going to be a, a huge one. We're going to um, we're going to get real get deep into. Uh, uh, Volkanovski versus uh, Korean Zombie, which is uh, which is on next week, and of course we have uh, a training partner of uh, of Alex Volkanovski is right here in our ranks. And uh, for those wondering, it's not me; it's actually um, it's actually Justin. So um, mm. yeah, we'll we'll have, we'll be able to get in, get some real insight into into Volkanovski's camp and uh, and and what we can expect on fight night. So that's going to be a fun one. What do you got uh, coming up? Yeah, obviously. Uh... I'm fighting May 7th, like I said earlier. I don't know if I was meant to announce that yet or not, but I'm going to go fucking do what I want. It's my show, our show. We do what we want. Um, you know, Cam, Soz, but not Soz. Uh, yeah, so see, there's that. Um, yeah, like we, you just you just touched on, Volko's camp wraps up this week, and then he'll be uh, heading out to the US. Um, you know, so he'll be going for another Ruby fighting Korean Zombie. So I'm all... I'm all hyped about that. I'm excited to see the work that he's done in this camp again um, to get put on display. Uh, he's going to, I see a finish. He's, you know, obviously we're going to break it down in detail in, on our next episode, but yeah, I can see him finishing zombie and putting on an absolute show and, you know, getting out there and uh, giving us another memorable post fight press conference again. Cause I don't know if you saw the last one, but it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely, and yeah, we're looking forward to, to breaking that one on, breaking that one down. And yeah, everyone, thanks for listening, and we'll see you in episode nine. Here I am, climbing up, feeling.